right. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, well, good evening. Thank you very much for the invitation to attend uh, your event. My name is Robert W. E. Laurie. I'm uh, joining from Vancouver Island, British Columbia. I'm just uh, right across from the uh, city of Vancouver. And uh, my alumni, I, I went to Oxford University, St. Edmund Hall in England for my law schooling and then qualified as a solicitor to the Supreme Court of England and Wales before coming home in 2011 and requalifying in Canada as a barrister solicitor. Um, happy to get into the distinction between barrister and solicitor if you like, but um, Basically, I go to court and do deals in the boardroom, which um, covers both of those, those avenues. Um, I uh, did my undergrad in political science and international relations at the University of British Columbia. And it's uh, how I got into this space is kind of, well, it's not, uh, it's kind of unusual. My younger brother's best friend was Seth Rogen's dealer for seven and a half years. <laughs> yes. And the character Saul in Pineapple Express is loosely based on a guy named John Carr, or Johnny C, as he was known in the early 90s. And so when I was in junior high, Johnny got arrested again for the second time for uh, possession and possession for the purpose of trafficking. He was growing his own cannabis uh, in the UBC endowment lands. And, he got nailed in those days, and I mean, it was pretty much in the early 90s, it was the Hells Angels and other organized crime groups that were utilizing hydroponic grows and cheap electricity as we have in the Pacific Northwest, as well as utilizing all of those amazing American genetics that made their way to British Columbia through draft dodgers in the 70s. So Vancouver, where I'm from, is predominant. I mean, BC Bud, the name is in it. Um, and uh, for me, I, um, I started my own practice nine years ago and having, if you will, grown up in the space with an Oxford law degree and having worked for Sullivan and Cromwell and other large British and American law firms and then doing my Canadian articles with Borden, Ladner, Gervais, um, I had some unique and interesting experience and so when I I finished up as legal counsel on one of the largest short and distort securities fraud cases, which involved me going to New York once a month for meetings with the FBI and the SEC. I was sort of left in a position of, well, what do I do? And I ended up starting my own law practice, which about a year later, the city of Vancouver just decided, you know, hey, we're gonna regulate retail cannabis, which, was two and a half years before the Liberal government uh, with Justin Trudeau introduced the Cannabis Act. So having started a law practice and looking for work, um, and you know, and be careful what you wish for. Um, you know, again, when the city of Vancouver announced they were going to regulate a controlled substance that was federally illegal, I wasn't too sure, you know, if I should venture into this, but ultimately, I think it was you know, due to the training and the experience and reflecting on my first you know, year of criminal law at Oxford, which my professor said, effectively, you can say whatever you want, right? But there will come a time where a police officer, a judge, a member of parliament, uh, you know, a Mountie, whoever, a customs officer will say two words. And those two words are, show me. And ultimately, provided you can back up your case, whether that is through decision, best practice, you know, uh, guidance from a common law jurisdiction, I mean, that little nugget of, or grain of sand can turn itself into the, a pearl with the right argument. And, and so I ended up, I guess, from that point on, um, just being full out representing all things cannabis because there were, again, a difference between people that understood the industry and those that were getting into it because of, they saw, I guess, you know, dollar signs in the industry. And I guess that's one of the beautiful things I love about cannabis and that, you know, it's why I went to law school instead of becoming a grower like Johnny is ultimately I realized that 
you know, this is a falling price commodity. I mean, let's face it, the price of hemp, which is the same thing really as cannabis, and they weren't, cul they weren't cultivating the THC out of the hemp in 1935, the year before the, the Marijuana Stamp Act, and according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, a pound of hemp, Indian hemp weed, was 37 cents a pound. Mm. So adjust for inflation, I do, you know, say as a cautionary tale that cannabis is a race to the bottom. I mean, the best years for cannabis growers, at least in Canada, were in the late 90s. Why? Because a price of a pound of cannabis would go for easily to 2,500. It would double once it crossed the border if it was from BC. Wow. And then you would be getting on the currency exchange, depending on how strong the US dollar was the Canadian dollar. So you could be looking at upwards of maybe $6,000 a pound. Now, in the legal market, you know, big producers are doing pounds for about $450, um, which for them is leading to a lot of competition, which is causing the price to drop even in the unregulated market. So part of my advice, I guess, to law students and those operating in the cannabis space is be a really good lawyer because you'll be able to charge market rates and with your experience, you'll be able to um, adjust your rates with your experience. Um, and, and so that experience really enabled me, at one point I was representing 40% of the unlicensed market in their um, attempts to get licensed by the city of Vancouver. And so myself and about seven other lawyers, we sued the city of Vancouver, the provincial government and the federal government over their regulatory strategy, which they ultimately brought in a regulatory policy disguised as an, or an elimination strategy disguised as a regulatory policy. And mainly we uh, use the arguments of the 300 meter buffer that they claim was best practice from California, no, from Washington and Colorado, which we demonstrated with expert lawyers from Colorado, that no, the 300 meter buffer had nothing to do with land use and everything to do with US federal criminal sentencing guidelines. Now, at the end of the day, we lost our case, but you know, as they say in cool hand loop, sometimes nothing can be a real cool hand and, and ultimately, this was an instance where the city of Vancouver went to regulate a area outside of their jurisdiction, and we were able to use that to our advantage, representing these dispensaries by effectively bringing an injunction and then attempting a charter argument. Anyways, um, that success, or at least that experience, allowed me to then start doing work in the psychedelic space, and I helped get the first Section 56 exemption, that's a ministerial exemption for psilocybin access um, for therapeutic purposes. Yeah, that was in August 2020. And, um, well, you know, the, um, the, you know, the interesting area is that, you know, when people say, what are you, are you, you know, what is a cannabis lawyer? I, I have to say, you, you really gotta be a good lawyer in some core areas because that ultimately is what you're clinging to. So, you know, for me, it's administrative law. I love challenging government and judicially reviewing decisions, but I also enjoy the criminal law and the quasi-criminal aspect. and. You know, you get that with cannabis uh, in spades these days, enforcement and, as well as um, as well as uh, administrative proceedings, and then of course, good old corporate, commercial, and business law. I mean, that's what I trained as initially. But again, if you can demonstrate to clients and assist them and help them navigate the waters, um, you, you know, you you will have no shortage of work. So. I look like I'm coming up to about 30 seconds here before I have to hand it over. Um, you know, and I would say too, know the rules. I mean, if you're gonna go out and sail in open waters and rough seas, you gotta know your rules of professional conduct, because especially if your regulator comes to visit, 
Um, you got to make sure you're in your ship shape, especially if you're going to venture into these newer areas of law. So happy to answer any questions and hope that was interesting for you. Yes, I, I found it interesting, Robert. Thank you. Uh, now we have Shane in Israel. Um, and I don't know if you want to divide it up five minutes each, but you're on. Sure, sounds good. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Uh, all right, so uh, basically, uh, Israel and I's Canada story kind of starts together. Um, we uh, met about four and a half years ago uh, when we came into a legal company. Uh, shout out to Arizona. Uh, they were a cannabis coffee and tea beverage company. Uh, so we started as uh, associate brewers on the team there and uh, kind of quickly realized within the first few months of that that there was an opening on the compliance side. Um, so basically, um, within the first, I'd say, three to six months, months of that employment there, we kind of uh, started reading up on the regulations. Uh, basically, at the time, the PCC regulations, uh, there was three different departments that were in control of the California cannabis industry. Uh, somewhat they've been, they've been consolidated now into the DCC, um, but still uh, there's some issues there. But uh, we'll uh, maybe cover those later at another time, maybe. But um, anyway, so yeah, I guess uh, then over the last three years or so, we've been in uh, cannabis compliance, uh, focusing mostly on the distribution and manufacturing side, uh, then building out into procurement and operations. Uh, basically, we started in uh, we started seed sale compliance or seed sale consulting here in February, uh, and have been uh, working in that department ever since. Uh, before we were working about twelve months before that, so we had about eighteen months or so of uh, compliance uh, in the campaign. I think what sparked our want to learn the regulations was with this beverage company, the CBPH had a lot of questions about what we were doing, especially with this and be harmful to the people. Um, so we worked really closely with the CBPH to try to write these regulations in place and work with them to make a product that was safe for the public. Um, and I think that just sparked it in us that there's a lot to learn here. Nobody really reads up on the regulations. This was before tracking basically kicked in. We were right when the regulations were kicking in in 2018. So track and trace was all done by paper and by hand. Um, so we got to experience a handful of audits uh, with the CBPH here in San Diego. Um, from that beverage company, we moved on to a, one of the top 10 cannabis brands in California at the time and were compliance officers for them. Um, and as well, I think Shane started a community side to that business for the charity side. So we do a little bit of everything. I come from social work, so uh, my background is in law. rather than just it's that because we've been told it's that. Um, and, and that just, I think Shane really took that compliance to the next level and that kind of followed closely in mind. Um, but we've done everything from working with uh, the CBPH to implementing track and trace was one of the first. Um, I got to work with a lot of labs who didn't understand how to work track and trace and trying to help them navigate how to use the system that worked for both parties, right? Like they didn't understand how the processes were done at the manufacturing distribution level. They lacked that knowledge, so we had to work hand in hand to create the process that worked for everyone. Um, so that was one of the first experiences that really uh, pushed me to want to even learn more and then go and do it on my own, um, apart from this business that we worked for. Um, when I left, it was still a private business then was acquired by a multi-state operator. Um, and then they hired us on as consultants. Again, it's learned and grown and, and learned a lot from being able to get them deals with white label parties, uh, procurement, uh, insurance audits, just everything hands-on. We're just hands-on type of individuals so like to learn as we go. Um, no law experience, like I said. So we still always refer back to, you know, go back to the lawyers and do right, you know, standard operating procedures, uh, master manufacturing protocols. Um, but really, it's really just 
started with learning the regulations and becoming familiar with them and then staying on top of this with us. And as I think they just mentioned, it, it's important to, to know what's going on. It's constantly changing uh, every day. And, and the Tracy Office was part of it, joining the association of the CIA. Um, we're part of their legislative uh, committee as well. And, So you, you you both started in a law firm, and then did you go off on your own together and no. develop your uh, compliance piece, or did you stay with the firm and develop the compliance piece? We have no law background. Uh, I knew uh, that I did some social work, um, started in production, <coughs> read the regulations before anybody really cared to read the regulations. Even the owners of the businesses we were working for did not care to read the regulations wasn't their issue, so um, just saw a gap, and we can capitalize on that gap. Um, we're, we're a little cheaper than a lawyer, you know, so we're gonna get to do a little bit of the, the groundwork, uh, and then present that to the lawyer, who the lawyer says, this is correct, this is right. Um, so we have worked closely with lawyers as far as audits go. We handle the audits, but the lawyer's there to be like, we'll answer those questions later, you know, just to protect the, the business. So what advice do either of you or both of you have for the students? I know that they're mostly law students and people in the law, and you're not lawyers, but certainly you are certainly connected to a lot of the legalities of cannabis practice and cannabis industry. What advice would you give uh, our uh, soon-to-be lawyers about how to work with consultants? Uh, I would start first, I guess, um, as far as if you're looking to get into consulting work, uh, learn from the plant up. Um, buy yourself a good kind of grower's Bible and learn the actual insides and outs of maybe taking care of getting a little bit of that green thumb action uh, yourself, maybe learning uh, how to plant uh, tomatoes first or uh, really kind of getting in and learning the horticulture side, even just to a cursory level. Um, there's a lot of great books out there that um, you can pick up for you know, 50, 60 bucks and will take you through basically your an entire career's worth of knowledge. Um, and I would say starting there really, um, and then blossoming out into, I think, uh, the regulations again, um, what's been said already tonight, uh, we can't, you know, we can't handle that enough. Um, really those are the most, those are the foundations of the industry. Um, learning and understanding those that then also work with the, uh, the regulations, so groups like the CCIA, um, groups like San Diego Normal or California Normal or uh, various different other trade organizations uh, are fantastic to get involved with. They're always looking for people, always looking for volunteers. Uh, I know especially the CCIA has uh, worked extensively with California lawmakers and uh, if anybody's interested in that field as well, uh, they're always looking for support. What, what is CCIA? Uh, CCIA, excuse me, sorry, is the California, uh, is the California Cannabis Industry Association. Uh, and they're based out of Sacramento and they're a small team, but they've been around for about 10 years now and uh, they've been uh, essential in the development of the California industry here. Um, so it's, I'm, I'm sensing a, a kind of a theme here by all of the speakers and that is get involved. Yeah. Go to the conferences, get involved in the associations and the organizations and learn a lot. Most uh, definitely, okay. yeah. And, and there's a lot of people on campus that are always willing to talk and always willing to uh, essentially let them they'll they'll explain their full side of the industry all the ins and outs that they've come across because um, as also what's been mentioned tonight is that it's constantly evolving and uh, I wouldn't say volatile but it's also has a lot of ebbs and flows uh, there are a lot of checks and balances that can come in I guess somewhat so to speak um, especially in California just uh, over the last four years it feels like a lifetime really um, and a lot of people that have been in Kansas for those those years uh, you could say I guess each year in Kansas is kind of like um, so there's a lot of different uh, developments every day. Uh, so if you're looking for that, if you're looking, especially on the legal side, um, it's a fantastic field to develop a career in, and uh, I really couldn't recommend it more. Just to add to that as well, I was, you know, become familiar with the process of manufacturers, distributors, sometimes the regulations, it can be interpreted many, many ways. A lot of businesses interpret the regulations their own way to help them do business better for them. Um, 
so learning those things hands on, a lot of things that we noticed or that I've noticed is early on is the CBTH, the DCC, a lot of them are really kind of clueless. They really don't necessarily have too much hands on experience in the actual process. That when they come to regulate, they're more asking questions rather than actually like doing their sums in their song. They don't understand what's going on. So really being hands on gives you a different give you a quick example uh, from the New Mexico uh, development of their hemp program and their cannabis program. They recently went recreational as well. Um, and I was reaching out for a client of ours just to kind of see how their hemp program was developing if it was somewhat following along California's or somewhat Oregon or uh, any of the other states that have also developed their own programs. Um, I got to a phone uh, on the phone with uh, someone that was essentially like Israel mentioned, somebody that was uh, either supposed to be in charge of their department or supposed to be tier two or tier three employee. Um, but when I was going through my explanation of is uh, your definition of cannabis, is it you know, is the definition of hemp derived versus cannabis derived? How does that come into play in, in New Mexico? Um, basically, I was returned to the question of, well, you, let me stop you real quick. What's the difference between cannabis and a cannabinoid? And so it's, it's well, it, to tell you the difference, the cannabinoid is a part of cannabis is a building block of it. There's, Roughly 70 to 100, uh, give or take. Uh, there's probably more that we'll find in the research. Can you move your microphone uh, a little closer to your mouth for those who are online? Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> sorry. Um, but uh, yeah, so essentially, the, the State Department, just to re reiterate what Israel has already covered there, is that um, they're not really up to date, essentially, on a lot of this information. So um, they're always going to be looking for people that are going to be able to fill them in themselves, even. Even right now, even in California, 50% um, of, of the municipalities in California still are uh, closed to cannabis, essentially. Um, so there's a lot of development. There's a lot, a lot of places to go, um, and uh, you know, the time is now for sure. But um, I, I wouldn't panic and you know, jump in too fast if you don't want to. You know, so uh, you have some time to do some research. I know we mentioned this tonight, all, uh, all of us, but. Um, Law students, I think you guys are the best at researching, so uh, I would say 